started, I want to thank you, everyone here, for joining us in this special occasion uh, where we're honoring the career of uh, Professor Jose Costa, who's just retired last April and is now an emeritus here. Um, anticipating, I'll just clue you in, I think you're in for a real treat today. Uh, we have three fantastic investigators and speakers. And I think the theme of all somewhat surrounding cancer, but unique approaches to our understanding of cancer uh, may be uh, new to some of you, and I think interesting to all of you, so stay tuned. Um, I think it's also worth mentioning that the selection of these speakers was not totally, a, it works, not totally an accident, nor was the naming of this symposium. Um, the idea being that um, what they represent is the combination of clinical observation, modeling, and experimentation as an approach to understanding translational cancer biology. And this is an approach that um, really has underpinned much of Jose Costa's career, beginning, I think, at least according to him, when I talked to him, with, well, there's Jose, got plenty of pictures of our featured speaker. When, uh, in 1969, uh, Jose uh, happened to come across this book by John Maynard Smith entitled Mathematical, Mathematical Ideas in Biology. And for Jose, this really crystallized what became a, a guiding feature of his approach to both medicine and scientific investigation. And I think it's fair to say that it came at a time where uh, he was still malleable and was influential and um, has sort of become the uh, guiding thing where Jose has um, structured much of his career. Um, by way of background, um, in fact, when he read this book, he was uh, in pathology training initially at uh, University of Colorado um, for a residency, and then ultimately at WashU under the aegis of the very uh, famous surgical pathologist, Lauren Ackerman. In fact, Curia, as a sidebar, when we managed to recruit Jose, and I'll come to that, I call that the third phase of his career. When we managed to recruit Jose, of course, we need to get uh, letters attesting to their qualifications to see if they're good enough to be on the Yale faculty. And Lauren Ackerman, who had retired at that time, but is generally regarded as one of the premier surgical pathologists. I'll, I'll never forget the letter he wrote. And he said, I've trained many pathologists, many very good pathologists, and three truly great surgical pathologists. And he named them. One was Juan Rosai, who used to be here at Yale, uh, Charles Daner, who is uh, still at WashU, and the third that he singled out was Jose Costa. So here was a great surgical pathologist who, after reading this book, apparently I got inspired that I wanted to do more and I wanted to do something different. And so after the surgical pathology training at Wash U, already an observationist, I guess you would say, um, Jose foolishly applied for a postdoctoral fellowship at the NCI um, and uh, was successful and moved from being a surgical pathologist at Wash U with Lauren Ackerman to the NCI where he joined forces with Alan Rapson at the time and began to investigate uh, some of the experimental and more scientific aspects of cancer biology. It's interesting, even in those dark days, um, uh, they with Alan proposed a theory that Kaposi sarcoma might actually be caused by a virus, a bit present for the time. Now we know that's true, but at the time it was not known. Um, and what was supposed to be a two-year fellowship at the NCI, um, as so want has happened, uh, turned into a 10-year stint. So we'll call that phase one of Jose's career, where he actually rose to be the director of pathology at the NCI and the director of the laboratory pathology there and worked with a number of luminaries, um, Jerry Crabtree, uh, Peter Howley, and many others who have gone on to very successful scientific careers. So, I think that speaks, that was very unusual for someone trained initially to be a surgical pathologist and further uh, whetted Jose's appetite for investigation coupled with observation. So after 10 years at the 
NCI, um, I would call this phase two of Jose's career. He uh, was recruited and went to Luzerne, Switzerland to assume the chairmanship of pathology at Luzerne. And there, um, this trend continued. Not only did Jose over supervise pathology, built collaborations with the Ludwig Institute, uh, the Swiss Cancer Institute, um, and actually embarked on, in collaboration, a plan of experimentation. And one of the things I was most impressed with was, and this is really the dawn of the genomic era in medicine at that time. And, um, you know, Jose tells me he's, he had the unfortunate uh, uh, circumstance of competing with Bert Vogelstein. But um, while there, under overseeing pathology, Jose actually um, demonstrated one of the people that demonstrate one of the first demonstrations that you could uh, induce apoptosis in P53 deficient cancer cells by restoring P53, something we now know is, is happens and is important. So very early stages of cancer biology, already this fusion of observation, surgical pathology with experimentation and predictability in science. Again, an important theme. Well, Jose was doing very well at, in Switzerland and around 1990, early 90s, I had the good or bad fortune, depending on what you look for it, to assume the role I'm now in, in running pathology here. And at that time, uh, we needed a new director of uh, the clinical service, director of anatomic path here. And looking around the landscape at the time, it was, I really wanted someone who was not just a good pathologist, but also someone who appreciated where the field was moving, what the opportunities were, the, uh, what was almost certainly to be the soon integration of genomics and molecular medicine into the diagnostic uh, armamentarium. And there weren't very many people, particularly at that time, who, who filled the bill. And I heard about this guy named Costa. And I really didn't know him at the time, but I did know that they had tried to recruit him to Memorial and that, um, and that he was in Wisconsin, Switzerland. So started corresponding with Jose. He's always very polite. It didn't sound like he was very interested. So with the help of my colleague here, Vin Marchese, we said, okay, we'll go, we'll go camp out on his doorstep in Switzerland. And, and not come home until we have our man. Um, so we did that. And I have to confess, I can tell it in retrospect, I arrived in uh, Luzon and Jose had this house overlooking a lake in this beautiful country. He was the chair of the Institute and I was trying to bring it back to New Haven. <laughs> and I had to say, I, I, you know, I didn't confess this, but I said, well, this is hopeless. Uh, why would you leave? But we fooled him. And um, he saw the opportunities here and uh, we were successful in 1993. He joined us here as my vice chair and the director of this clinical service. And shortly thereafter, a circumstance would have it, um, Vince DeVita, who had just been recruited to um, head the cancer center here, was someone that Jose had already interacted with down at the NCI. And so there was a match there that quickly crystallized and uh, so Jose also became the deputy director of the cancer center. And though that, that serendipitous uh, fusion of two individuals, both newly recruited institution uh, was transformational. It was that time that um, major things were starting to happen, a reawakening, if you would, of our cancer center here, the generation of core facilities, uh, the dawn of molecular medicine, um, uh, a whole variety of things that Jose played a very big role in, perhaps culminating in, in, in under the direction of Dean Kessler and uh, Joe Zaccanino, who was the president of the hospital at the time, formed a committee to what did we need to do to transform cancer biology and cancer care here at Yale. And that led to something called the Ronin Report, which was the genesis of the plans to build the Smilo Cancer Hospital, which we have which is a reality now and has been transformational here. So from tiny, tiny seeds, great things grow. And I think we uh, owe a lot of debt to Jose and Vince DeVita for that early uh, change. Well, his career, yeah, I won't go on, has been nothing short of spectacular. Jose uh, 
was uh, directed the service for many, many years. Um, they continued to uh, collaborate on a variety of fronts uh, with Paul Lazardi here, got involved in, in ways to measure really earliest changes of cancer. One of the TAP problems I know Jose worked very hard on was to, uh, what are the earliest molecular events that define pre-cancer? And, and came up with a very interesting approach to that, uh, methods to do uh, really in the pre-next-gen sequencing days, uh, methylation analysis, whole genome amplification to get the sensitivities. One needs to study these things. Um, when he finally uh, gave up those roles, uh, Jose has continued to lead the uh, bone and soft tissue service here in the department. Uh, he was director of the autopsy um, and so forth. So he's been in so many different areas, a major uh, force for change and for the betterment of all of us in our institution. So these have been recognized. I can list the awards. I think they're on your, your handout. Um, he's received over his career, uh, let's see, the um, uh, Special Achievement Award from the NIH, Election of the American Association Advancement of Science, the Gold Medal of the International Academy of Pathology, the Trueta Medal from the Catalan government for contributions to public health. Um, he served on numerous national committees, advisor board, study sections. He was a co-editor-in-chief with myself in laboratory investigation. He was editor-chief of pathology research and practice. Um, Etc. So it's today we're the, the symposium we're, we're presenting. Really, um, let's see what's my next slide here. Yeah. So the three speakers today. I'm going to give you a brief introduction now. A complete introduction is in your notes. Just so when they come to speak, I'm not going to uh, prolong the introduction. So we have three speakers that represent these three threads that have been the sort of basis for how Jose has approached his own career. And I think they're very powerful threads. And again, as I said, for many of you, may be a bit of an eye opener of how powerful these different computational modeling and observational approaches can be to our understanding of the real biology of what happens in a tissue that's transformed uh, in a living host. So our first speaker is Dr. Larry Norton. Uh, Dr. Norton, of this picture, if you don't know. Uh, Dr. Norton is the Norma South Sarafin, thank you, Chair of Clinical Oncology and the Senior Vice President of Memorial Sloan Kettering. He holds appointments at Wild Cornell Medical College. Um, he is extraordinarily well known and published in the field. He has made major contributions, a lot of involving molecular modeling. Uh, he developed a mathematical model that's widely used in terms of cancer progression and cancer development. And he'll be speaking to us first this morning or afternoon. The second uh, speaker on our agenda is Dr. Kyle O'Malley, who is a cancer biologist. He's an associate professor at the Biodesign Institute at the University of Arizona. And he is um, a mathematician and an evolutionary biologist by training from MIT, who again has looked at aspects of cancer evolution as an evolutionary event and uh, the de uh, gained deep insights from that approach. And I think uh, he has some very interesting things to tell us this afternoon about that. And our third speaker is Dr. Ricard Sol from the Catalan Institute of Research and Advanced Studies in Barcelona, in Spain. I think it's in Barcelona, isn't it? Yes. Um, and he also directs the Complex Systems Laboratory at the Barcelona Biomedical Research Park. And again, Dr. Sol is a uh, trained biophysicist, biophysicist who applies mathematical modeling and systems biology approaches to these uh, problems in understanding cancer biology and cancer evolution. So the longer uh, CVs and things are in the notes, I won't belabor those now, but let's get started, I think, and welcome our first speaker, Dr. Larry Martin. Thank you. Larry. 